So I'm glad to be here. It's such an uh, intimate uh, room, it's a nice little room, and I hope that you guys will enjoy my talk about the Hadoop plugin uh, and Gradle for the Hadoop ecosystem. It's work that we are doing at LinkedIn. So why don't we get started? Okay. Okay, so first, I want to say you know, this is an open source talk. It involves a lot of open source uh, pieces of technology, including uh, especially Hadoop. Uh, and in the Hadoop ecosystem, most of these things, of course, are open source, and they tend to fall under the Apache Software Foundation. And so the proper name of these things is actually Apache Hadoop, Apache Pig, Hive, and so on like that. But I will just call it Pig, Hive. I, actually, Groovy now. Groovy now is actually a G project as, as well. Um, but, but we will drop that for the name. The Hadoop plugin, which is the, what we have been working on at LinkedIn, uh, it will be open source. We, I basically just need to put it through legal. And it's going through legal now. And basically, just the issue is just the name, uh, you know, when it's finally released, we'll probably have like some other you know, LinkedIn plugin for Hadoop or something like that. It probably will not be the, the Hadoop plugin. Um, but that's just how we'll refer to it, to it in the talk. Uh, but just so you know, when it comes out, it has some weird name or something, it's still the, the Hadoop plugin. So just a little bit about, uh, there I am. Um, I do know some Kung Fu. I'm actually not, not so good at it, but I, I, know, I know a little bit, a little bit of Kung Fu and Tai Chi. Uh, I know some programming language Kung Fu. Uh, right now, I'm an engineer at LinkedIn working on Hadoop developer tools. And in the past, I have actually a formal background in programming language theory. It sort of just arose randomly from my work on Hadoop that I began, began working on Hadoop developer tools. But because one of the things that comes with the Hadoop plugin is the, the Hadoop DSL, and that is a, a language that we'll be talking about today, uh, it just sort of worked out that well, I also have a background in, in the, uh, that area. Um, so for this talk, I, I sort of like to have talks. I sort of like to know about the audience a little bit and sort of ask you guys things, uh, you know, what things that you have worked with in the past and, and sort of just keep it a little bit more interactive than sort of just 45 minutes straight of discussion. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys a couple things and I'm glad that it's kind of a, a small room so we can kind of all hear. Um, I hope that you'll learn something, and I'll mix some things that, especially about programming languages, so you guys have a lot of experience with it, and so um, you should have your own opinions. You should think for think, please think for yourselves if you you disagree with something I say, because there's a lot of room for opinions. So this is what we're going to discuss today. Is first we're going to cover some background about programming languages and DSLs. What is DSLs? Maybe not everybody knows what is the DSL. And it's always kind of fun to talk about programming languages. We'll talk some about Hadoop. And then we'll get into the meat of the, the presentation, which is about our work on the, the Hadoop Gradle plugin and the language that it comes with, the Hadoop DSL. And finally, at the end, we'll cover some lessons that some things that we learned during the design of the Hadoop, uh, the release of the Hadoop plugin and its use of the company. And actually some things that I think should be actually added to Gradle uh, or you know, improvements to Gradle that would, would enable uh, more people to do things like this. So to start with, let's talk some about programming languages and DSLs. Because it's fun, and I want everybody to know what is a DSL if you don't know what it is. Um, so at the bottom are some logos from some of my favorite programming languages. Or not favorite, but just some that I have used in the, in the past. Does anyone know all three? All three? What are the logos? OK, no one knows. That's OK. We will cover, cover them in just a second. OK, so my first thing for you guys is to get to know you is um, I'd like to ask you to raise your hand if you have written a non-trivial, whatever that means, non-trivial to you, whatever it means, amount of one of the following. And the first one is assembly, any assembly language. 
is like half the people, half the people, but basically, basically in the audience. And I, I am blown away. Now, I, I understand you are at Siena and it's a hardware company, so I, maybe I'm a little bit less surprised. But um, on, what's, on what sort of system have you, have you done assembly on? Uh, have you ever heard of an IBM 360? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Boy, you cannot get much more classic than that, yeah? <laughs> yeah, there's probably still a lot of work on and IBM 360s out. Wonderful. I mean, you know, maybe I should have expected a few more hands because we are basically like, you know, this is semiconductor alley, literally, literally like right out here. So it's not quite as big of a surprise. You might have should ask how too. Yes. Yes. Great point. Great but point. I don't have to assembly anymore. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Neither, neither do I. Um, Cobol or Fortran? Yeah. Yeah. So some I have. It's you know still a lot of it out there. Um, how about I uh, see in C++, right? We've got we've got a lot of hardcore developers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're very very nice. We've all cut our teeth, you know. C and C++. Me too. Um, and I, I'm sure that most of us have done modern languages, which I am calling Java, Groovy. Actually, yes. Everyone who has done one of Java, Groovy, Scala, Python, or any .NET, any of the Microsoft .NET languages. Basically, basically, like yeah, 100%. Right? How about um, Lisp, Scheme, or ML? Let's mean. Where, where did you do? Where did you do one of those? It's a computer science course. Really? Yeah. Uh, long ago or recently? It's long ago. Long ago. Okay. Okay. Which which one? Lisp. Uh, scheme. The really? Topic. Okay. 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 Wonderful. That's awesome. That's why I, I did a lot of scheme back in the, but only academic, academic and open source. Anyone use Haskell or OCaml? Very nice. Anybody else? Very nice. Okay, cool. As part of work or just personal? Uh, computer science. Okay, yeah. Computer science. One of. Okay, yeah. yeah. Me too. Okay, so there's some things going on in programming languages right now. Of course, there are many things going on. These are just a couple. Um, but there are a couple of things that are, are undeniably true happening in computer language. Yeah, I, one is a trend towards virtual machines and garbage collection. Another, which has come very recently, is more of a recognition of languages have first class support for object oriented systems and also functional programming. And the biggest, you know, most obvious trend towards this is the, the influence of Scala on Java. Java 8 now has a number of functional constructs, uh, and that comes directly from the, the influence of both, actually originated from Groovy, and, and Scala on, uh, on Java 8. Um, a second one is types. There was a big trend actually away from type systems towards untyped languages, sort of like in the early 2000s, right? Python, you know, types maybe not so great. Um, and actually, recently, just in the last couple of years, types have started to come back. Facebook is adding a type system for JavaScript, inferential type system for JavaScript. Guido von Van Rossum himself has proposed type annotations to be added to Python. And things like monads even are going in C++. Monads. Um, and I mention these because these are all leading towards better support for, for DSLs. So what's a DSL? Well, of course, we have to ask Wikipedia, well, what's a DSL? And so uh, Wikipedia says, a DSL, it's a language that's specialized for a particular domain. And that is in contrast to a general purpose language, which is broadly uh, applicable uh, and lacks specialized features for, for a domain. So I think we can say a lot more about that, but maybe we'll just kind of, for the talk, we'll just sort of leave uh, that where it is. But how about an embedded DSL? What's the difference between a DSL and an embedded DSL? And this, you cannot really ask Wikipedia. We'll tell you a little bit. So the definition that I will use for this talk is an embedded DSL is when your, your language, your DSL, it's implemented with another language and is also compatible with that language in the sense that it can contain expressions that are written in the, uh, the implementing language. So the Gradle DSL fits this definition. It's 
to DSL, it's specialized to the domain of all the things we're talking about today. Build systems and tools and other things. And it's embedded, it fits this definition. This is a great old DSL, it's implemented in Groovy, Java and Groovy and can contain Java and Groovy language expressions. So one of the things I like to talk about in the talk, and the point of why we're here today, is about the design of an embedded DSL for Gradle, and this is something we'll come back to in the, in the, in the talk. Okay. So my next background section is about Hadoop. Uh, if you don't know, the logo of Hadoop is an elephant. And this comes from the, one of the creators of Hadoop. His daughter had a, had a bunch of toy animals, and one of the, the animals, the name is, is Hadoop, the toy animal. So that's where it kind of comes from. Uh, so now, the next thing to know for me to learn about you is I like to start off by asking, who has written any sort of MapReduce job before in any language? It could be Java or, or C++ or someone like that. We have couple in the back. I've got my course we were talking a little bit before. Um, how about you guys? Where, where are you guys uh, doing it for work? And uh, what's uh, part of what's... Uh, let's start with uh, you. Cool. Cool. And, and You got it. Recommendations, right? That's like the 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 one of the big things. Crank through recommendations. Crank through big data on, on Hadoop. This is actually the first thing that LinkedIn uses uh, Hadoop Hadoop for, uh, and why we originally have a Hadoop cluster. Although it's no longer one of the major things that we do. We still do it, of course. But let's we'll discuss that in a second. Um, has anyone written? Nobody's written an Apache. You guys have not used Apache Spark at all, have you? A, a little bit. A little bit? Are you guys using Spark at all? OK, OK. It's like the hot new thing in Hadoop, Hadoop, Hadoop land. I'll, I'll, come back, I'll come back to it in just, just a little bit. So not everybody's familiar with Hadoop or has used it before. So I'd like to cover a little bit of background. What is Hadoop? Well, it's about big data, right? That's what, you know, Hadoop, everybody's heard the buzzword. Hey, it's, it's big data. It's storage and processing for big data. It comes out of two papers originally from Google. One is about the Google file system. The other is about MapReduce, the programming model for, for Hadoop, the original programming model for Hadoop. These papers are on the internet. And you should uh, read them if you, you have the time and are interested in, in about it. Uh, Hadoop itself, open source, is largely written about two miles from here. We are in Santa Clara. And it is over at Yahoo. That's where much of the early work is done on Hadoop. Uh, and a lot of people are still, still there or very close uh, nearby uh, at different companies here in the Valley. Today, we are in a Hadoop 2 world. And in Hadoop 2, major pieces of the system, and I'm sort of glossing over a lot of you know, details, is for storage, Hadoop uses its own distributed file system really the crown jewels of Hadoop. It's one of its most, you know, if you're like really into Hadoop, this is the major innovation. MapReduce is not the major innovation. The major innovation is the Hadoop distributed file system for storing your data across an entire grid or cluster of computers. It has a resource management and scheduling framework called Yarn. And we'll say that it has the MapReduce framework. It actually has, supports many programming models now. But it has the MapReduce uh, programming model for, for big data. We'll, we'll just leave that as where it is. Yeah, uh, where it is. At LinkedIn, Hadoop currently consists of actually about 10 different grids with quite a few nodes. We have a little bit less than 10,000 nodes, multi-core core machines. So we have quite a bit of compute power. And let me tell you, these, our clusters are basically busy 24-7. So we are using them, cranking on those things all the time. Our grids actually have different use cases. Some of them are ad hoc grids, where users can run experiments uh, on an ad hoc basis. They can just submit a job to the cluster. 
Some are production grids, which mean that all, all jobs that run on that grid uh, have SLAs and are scheduled to run at regular intervals. And LinkedIn has data on the petabyte scale. So we have like something in the order of 50 petabytes, something like that of data. It sort of depends how you count the data, if you count replicated data or, or you know, multiple copies of the same data or not. Hadoop starts at LinkedIn in 2008 with the feature for recommendations. It's called People You May Know. LinkedIn's most one of the most popular features on LinkedIn, PYMK. It suggests people on LinkedIn with whom you might want to connect. It does an eerily good job of suggesting like former coworkers that you worked with, you know, 20 years ago, and uh, only once in a while will it suggest an ex-girlfriend or boyfriend. Not so much. I've seen it once. Um, but today, Hadoop uh, at LinkedIn has, we have uh, basically, we have about 2,000 users. And what it means is that essentially every full stack developer at LinkedIn uses Hadoop. And that is because machine learning irrelevance, which is considered the standard use case of Hadoop, for a lot of people, if they think about it and they say, hey, this is Hadoop, it's for relevance. And in fact, actually, every feature at LinkedIn is essentially has some Hadoop component. Um, LinkedIn might send you a few emails every once in a while, maybe, maybe more than a few. So in fact, actually, LinkedIn sends billions of emails every week. Maybe it's not such a surprise for everybody. Um, but when you send billions of emails a week, you cannot write a standard Java program that actually comes up with those emails and sends it. It's too much email. So the way we actually generate our emails, we actually generate the serialized you know, content of your email in Hadoop. And then we have a specialized program that then takes those serialized uh, emails and, and, and sends them out in bulk. We actually build our search indexes in Hadoop. We also actually populate most of our key value stores offline in Hadoop using our open source uh, key value store called Voldemort. And we have a way to do that very efficiently. And then we do some standard stuff. We do also analytics. And we still do, of course, all of our relevance uh, in Hadoop. But those are no longer the largest uh, use cases at the, at the company, which is kind of fun to know. So if you work with Hadoop, Basically, what you do is you write a Hadoop job. Hadoop job, it reads data from HDFS, does some processing on your cluster. LinkedIn, our largest cluster, currently consists of about 2,000 machines. And you may use all 2,000 machines when you do some processing. And then generally, you write some result back to HDFS. You may write it some other place as well. Uh, but you'll write some result back to HDFS. When you write a Hadoop job, it might be a Java job. You just write Java code to do MapReduce programming model. You can actually use SQL now on Hadoop. It's a dialect of SQL. It's not exactly SQL, with something called Apache Hive. Or you can write a script. It kind of looks like a sort of like a very simple, a little bit more than a shell script, but a little more complicated. It's got its own language, Apache Pig. There's a couple cool things, a couple trends, hot trends happening in Hadoop land. One is a system is the idea of interactive speed SQL. So if you write a Hive SQL script, it may run your SQL script in many seconds or minutes or many minutes. And the idea with a system like Presto from Facebook is that you write, you write a SQL script, and it may process terabytes and terabytes of data but return a result to you in just a few seconds. And if you're more interested in how that works, grab me after the, the, the talk, and I can, I can tell you how that's, how that's even possible. If you're interested in learning Hadoop, something about it, I would encourage you that kind of the hot thing in, in Hadoop is something called Apache Spark. And the idea is to load as much of your data as you can into RAM, pin it there, and keep cranking on your data as much as you can while that data is pinned into RAM before you have to write it back to HDFS or do something, do something or flush it from RAM. 
or so on. And so if you're looking for a new Hadoop job, learn Spark. And that would be the, the hot thing to have on your, your resume. So if you write a Hadoop job, generally a job doesn't do much. Right? It, just, it does some processing, some discrete processing. And uh, I mean, of course, you can have arbitrary jobs with arbitrary complexity. But generally, you do some processing, you write back a result to HDFS. And in fact, people you may know uh, takes many Hadoop jobs to compute, kind of look through all the things that you've done on LinkedIn, and figure out, try to deduce who else at LinkedIn that you might know that you're not yet connected with, who might be your ex. And the way this works is, of course, later jobs are dependent on earlier jobs. And so let's call a Hadoop workflow. It's something like you string together these jobs. And what you do is you say, how later jobs depend on earlier jobs. And this actually forms a DAG of jobs. It's a directed, directed acyclic graph. If that means nothing from you, that doesn't mean anything to you, then I'll show you a picture, and it will be very obvious what that, that means. And so that's what a Hadoop workflow is. You run a Hadoop workflow in a Hadoop workflow manager. So it's what schedules your workflow and basically shows you the results and has like a user interface for you for, you know, for, for these things. Um, at LinkedIn, we've written one called Azkaban. And we've also recently adopted one from that was originally developed at Yahoo called Apache Uzi. There's also several others. There's a new one from uh, Airbnb called Airflow. And there are actually more that are available. And they all kind of have their pluses and minuses. But one thing that they all share is that everyone has its own little mini configuration language for how you set up all the, what are, how you specify where are all the jobs in a workflow. How do you say what jobs depend on what? So uh, to make this concrete, this is a picture of Azkaban. And so Azkaban has kind of a cool UI. It looks, it looks kind of nice. Um, this is a workflow that sends you, prepares emails to send to you. It consists of about 100 jobs. And, you know, in the screenshot, I can just show like maybe 15 or so, so uh, up there. And what this is showing you is that basically, you start with the jobs at the top. Those are the first jobs that you have to run in the workflow. Uh, and those jobs are short. So they just have little, little green bars. They sort of run, I know you can't see the times, but they run sort of for seconds or minutes. And once those are done, the jobs in the middle can kick off. And then down at the bottom, you sort of have the jobs towards the end of the workflow. And you can see there's a big one, the second to last one. That one actually takes uh, over an hour to run. And some of the jobs at the top are using Apache Pig. Uh, and the jobs in the middle are actually Java MapReduce jobs. So this is kind of what you do with a workflow manager, is you coordinate this group of jobs to accomplish this big, sort of more complicated task that you achieve by chopping it up into little discrete pieces. Question, yes? In, in, in all, of this, all of this processing and compute power and machine power is, is basically to, to reduce our data to something that we can analyze and use and clean and cleanse. It looks like it's formatting and cleaning and cleansing is like 90% of the work. That's absolutely right. So, so just to repeat for the camera, sort of the question is how much of the processing is just simple stuff like loading, filtering, cleansing, aggregating the data, and sort of how much of it is kind of like magic, like machine learning. And uh, the, you made the comment that sort of not, is 90% of it probably the simple stuff? And the answer is absolutely. In fact, I would say probably more. I'd probably say like 95% of it is just really, you know, you're loading, user information, things users have done, what they've clicked on, filling in nulls in the data, stuff like that. And actually having skills with that is uh, probably the most effective skill set of a data scientist at LinkedIn. That's actually a term that comes from the founding data scientist at LinkedIn, who is now working for part-time for the White House and also for Salesforce. Uh, he sort of came up with the, you know, popularized, not came up, but popularized that term uh, a few years ago. And those are really the skills. Those are really the skills. A little bit of it is like, at LinkedIn, for machine learning, we generally apply logistic regression. It's one of the simplest machine learning algorithms. So um, 
doesn't actually take all that much, you know, super hardcore mathematical skill to, to use these. Most of it is just doing things like this. So it takes five minutes to run the regression that you want, and it takes you like, like 95% of the time to get the data in a form that you can do the regression. Absolutely. Ouch. Absolutely. It's so true. Well, you know, it takes skills. Yeah, it takes skills. It's yeah. not it's not easy to clean, cleanse your data, no. you know. So so that's what these things are about, or to use Azkaban effectively. But then again, this is what the Hadoop DSL and the Hadoop plugin will come in is to help you use these things more effectively and try to reduce some of the pain of these things. So I used that term DAG before, and if you don't know what it means, this is what a DAG looks like, and what it tells you is that I have this workflow. And basically what it is is that things at the top have to run. I've said, I've said the user has said how jobs depend on each other. And this is a picture of it. And the things at the top have to run before the things at the bottom. So first, job A at the top, that's the green one, has to run. Because the middle jobs, the little lines, tell you that they depend on job A. And then at the bottom, it's job E. That's what that says at the bottom. The little lines there say that job E depends on the things that are in the middle. And so basically, job A has to run, and the things in the middle have to run, and then the thing at the bottom, the thing at the bottom, that's the last job in the workflow. So that's what a DAG is. So if I use that term and nobody knew, knows what it means, it's just a little picture of how your, your jobs have to run. And the DAG specifies an ordering for, for your jobs. If anybody's really on the ball, I need to ask if can you have cycles in your, your DAG, and you, you cannot. Oh, cycle in, uh, in uh, ask a man DAG, it will complain. Um, OK, so, so we've been talking some about the background of Hadoop. And now I want to talk some about um, the state of development of Hadoop in general, in particular at LinkedIn. So LinkedIn, this is a year ago. This is not the 1980s. We're not using you know, Tickle and things. This is one year ago. A year ago, I don't know if um, we had some speakers. I'm sure we had some speakers here at Gradlestock basically telling you that most of LinkedIn was in pretty good shape. So we, we have adopted Gradle and Gradle most of our projects, except in Hadoop land. So Hadoop land is in terrible shape a year ago. Um, almost no projects use Gradle. Most are actually using the Ruby build system called Rake at Maven and Ant. When you deploy to Hadoop, people make some local changes and upload to Hadoop. They, they, whereas in the online world, we have a system that will build your code from source control and upload it to, to online services. And this means that actually, after a while, most people don't know what code they have running in Hadoop. Because they made some changes locally, ran it in Hadoop, kind of forgot about it, and like a few weeks later, they're like, "Dang, what did I have? What, what version of that project did I have?" You know, and then they complain to us. They're like, "Hey, today my workflow broke." It's like, "Well, what did you have running before?" I don't know. I don't. So this is this is not good, right? We we're in pretty bad shape. Um, on top of it, the developers of the company. Of course, when you uh, don't fix problems for you, they start fixing it for themselves. They write a system on top of Rake. The system is Ivy for dependencies. Uh, so you know specifies some dependencies by Ivy, but not all of them. No one actually uh, on the team, no, very few of the users on these teams using this homegrown system actually know how to use Ivy. They don't know how to add dependencies to it. Because IV.xml files are not that simple. Um, the homegrown system does include things like Gradle tasks, includes rake tasks for Hadoop components. And it actually includes a DSL for LinkedIn's workflow scheduler, uh, Azkaban, which is kind of neat. So with this homegrown fixes, there are homegrown problems. So the system works. But basically, the developers write this system and don't really maintain it. So as the original developers of this system kind of leave, the new people sort of can't make any changes to it. 
but all the projects, all the Hadoop projects are in this system. It doesn't work with LinkedIn's new uh, automatic deployment system. And because of its use of sort of half use of Ivy, essentially when you look at people's projects, there's just binaries everywhere. Everywhere. It's just like binaries, binaries, binaries. People actually like misplace them and stuff. There's no documentation. You have to ask somebody how to learn how to use it. Do you have to basically learn Ruby? You have to learn Ruby to use it. Uh, which is fine. Yeah, Ruby's a fine language, but you know, if you get hired at LinkedIn, most people don't know Ruby. Hey. So for this, I'm saying you know, Hadoop development at the company, it's the wild frontier and it stays wild even with the system on top of it. So what are we going to do about this? I, I love this picture of this stampeding elephant. I don't know if there's hyenas. How, I don't know how the hyenas think that they're going to go after the elephant. Um, but since we are talking some about languages, I have one more. I have, yeah, maybe I'll just, I'll just you know, I, I still, I still want to ask. Still don't want to ask. I talking about build systems and languages. I do want to ask a couple more. I'm, I'm curious. Um, who who's used Make? Who's used Make? Has who has not used Make? Not used Make. Have you have you used Make before? No, no. Yeah, new people new people have 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 not really used Make. Yeah, but I yeah we have all sort of written a ton of files for of us. Um, how about Ant? We all use Ant too? Yeah, we, yeah, we all use Ant. And how about Maven? I'm curious. So we, we just like basically everybody's been through every system. I actually skipped over Maven a little bit. I only have to sort of use a little bit. But, uh, you know, so we all sort of have been through the whole, the whole progression. I see. And it's been a long, it's been a long progression. Okay. So basically this is what's going on with Hadoop. Right? And Hadoop... It starts with Ant, people use Maven, it doesn't solve the problems. They run this Ruby build system on top of it. And it's a mess. Uh, I ordered to gradalize their projects. And they refuse. They actually refuse to gradalize their projects in this whole division. So, so LinkedIn has a few divisions. And that makes it easier to ignore this order because one entire division, the head of the whole division, the recommendations division, offline computation, just says no. They they can't they can't they can't do it. It has good reasons because they, they don't have these rate tasks and they have this Ruby DSL thing. So what we do is we write the Hadoop plugin. We have a plugin for Gradle called the Hadoop plugin. It starts to provide you functionality for Hadoop pieces. And it has something else. It has the Hadoop DSL, which will let uh, developers move away from this Ruby DSL thing. We'll talk about it in a bit. That'll be the next section. So Azkaban, what it does is when you build, you build your Hadoop project, you will build, and it will upload a zip with all of your various dependencies, usually you have a lot of jars in these things when you upload to Hadoop. It has all your compiled uh, Hadoop jobs and workflows to Azkaban. If you're working with Pig, it will upload your scripts onto Hadoop and execute them for you without leaving your local box. Otherwise, you have to kind of do like a lot of copying, sort of back and forth, and you got to kind of get all this pig command line right and stuff like that. It's just a lot of copying and, and so on like that, editing stuff. It's not that complicated, but using the Hadoop plugin, it just does it for you. It comes with the Hadoop DSL. It's a language. And basically the, what it does is when you build, it translates your Hadoop DSL code into code for Azkaban or Uzi. How it does it is when you write a user, you write Hadoop DSL code, the Hadoop DSL internally says, comes up with its own DAG to represent the workflows that you are describing in the Hadoop DSL. And at build time, it converts to an Azkaban DAG, 
Uzi DAG and serializes out file would configure that same configure that workflow for ASCII banner. And what we think is neat about the Hadoop DSL is that the Hadoop plugin, it's a Gradle plugin, but it really comes with its own language. It comes with its own language. Actually, a number of Gradle plugins actually have their own little mini languages for how you configure them, like the distributions plugin for, uh, for zip files. You, you come up with publish a zip or a tar, so it has like a little, little Gradle DSL syntax for how you use it. And that's what the Hadoop plugin comes with. But the configuration language for it is really a full featured language. It has a clean syntax. Uh, it's easy to learn. It just kind of looks like Java, little simple Java. It's got little brackets. Um, when you use a Hadoop DSL, you don't have to learn about the little quirks of Azkaban or Uzi, Uzi XML files, or those things. You just write simple Hadoop DSL files and say build for Azkaban, build for Uzi. And of course, it's an embedded DSL. It's completely compatible with Groovy and Gradle. So today, a year later, now everybody has finally, this division came around. They converted to Hadoop, to Gradle. Jars are actually stored in Artifactory, the company's Artifact repository. And for me, as one of the authors, what's satisfying is that people are writing incredible pieces of Hadoop DSL code. And I sometimes I just see like users Hadoop DSL code, and I'm just like blown away by what they're like. What? What are you doing with that? Um, so that's what's going on with the the Hadoop plugin. So what about the director that didn't want to have? Say it again. Once, so, so the question was about, I said that there's this, yeah, I said there's this division, yeah, division at LinkedIn that refused to migrate. Um, but once we provided the Hadoop plugin and it had equivalent functionality, we, we claimed it had equivalent functionality to the old thing, they had no choice but to, to you know, their primary reason, that was their primary reason for refusing. So they, they didn't have the functionality that the old system had. And now we did, and they had to trust us that we, in fact, had, had done a, you know, a good job on this thing. And, and, and it has worked out since people have been able to, to convert. Did the trust come quickly? Say it again? Did the trust come quickly, do you think? It came, when they started using the Hadoop DSL, it came right away. Okay. Because, because they, could, they, they knew that they could do, start to do things that were beyond just simple. They started doing complicated things quickly with little amounts of code because they used a Groovy, actually. Um, so that, that came that came right away. So I'd like so this is my last section, and then I have kind of a couple concluding slides. Um, and so this I'd like to tell you some about the Hadoop DSL and actually show you what it is. So like I said, the DSL is language, and I have a language background, and I set out explicit goals for what this language should accomplish before before we sat down and write it and wrote it. First one is it has an easy syntax. Simple, it's just kind of looks, it's easy to learn. Second is that if you remember back to our first slides, we talked about an embedded DSL. And so I explicitly said, this is going to be an embedded DSL. You're going to be able to have Hadoop DSL, Gradle, and Groovy all completely mixed together, just seamlessly in Hadoop DSL. Third is that we'll have a static verifier for it. It's a language, and it can be statically checked. And the fourth is when you write Hadoop DSL, you can build it for multiple workflow schedules. You say build for, for Azkaban, build for Uzi, et cetera, like that. So like I said, I, you know, in my opinion, I think it has a clean syntax. I took great pains to, to make this slide readable from like a huge ballroom way in the back. Um, so this is what the Hadoop DSL actually looks like. Uh, so the way it works is you can just put it directly in your build.gradle file. You know, most people actually put it in another file and they say, from, and they say apply from in their build.gradle script. But otherwise, you just put it directly in your build.gradle file. So I'm applying the Hadoop plugin. 
uh, I declare a Hadoop lock. It's Hadoop open breaks uh, bracket, and that means I'm in Hadoop, Hadoop DSL mode. I declare a workflow. In this case, I'm calling it workflow one. It's got an Apache pig job. That pig job uses a pig script, build groups.pig, and it declares what its inputs and outputs are. My pig script takes a uh, parameter, and so I actually just put the parameter name and parameter value directly in that job. The second job in my workflow is a Java MapReduce job. And I say explicitly that job two depends on job one. So when I upload this to Azkaban, Azkaban will realize, hey, I need to run job one first. Once job one is finished, I can run job two. I declare the Java class that my Java MapReduce job uh, runs. And I declare its inputs and outputs. And that's it. And that's it. It just kind of has, you know, it's kind of Java -y syntax like that and declares, you know, simple things for how the Hadoop DSL works. Do the, uh, the reads files and the writes files, are they, um, they, they declare themselves as task inputs and outputs in the cradle scheme things? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So the second thing I said was that it's an embedded DSL. So it's an embedded groovy Gradle DSL. And what it means, of course, is that just like Gradle, I can intermix Groovy anywhere completely with the DSL. And this is really one of the, the, the two most powerful features about the DSL. The other is the static checker. Next. Um, so at the top, I say I declare Groovy def, right? I have def something. And then I declare a job, uh, uh, a Hadoop DSL job on the next line. That's Hadoop DSL syntax job. And then right after that, I'm into if, right? An if statement, right? This is a groovy, just like you know, a regular if statement. It's not Hadoop DSL. And if that's true, I call some groovy function that I've got defined somewhere else, is training model. That's some other groovy function I defined somewhere else. And if that's true, I'm right back into Hadoop DSL and I set some properties on the job that I, I am in. If it's false, I set some other property and I, I call some other uh, groovy function, get evaluation model name with some other groovy args. So, it's completely intermixed. It's completely intermixed between uh, Gradle, uh, between uh, Hadoop DSL, and uh, Groovy. And this actually has huge values because workflows at the company can have hundreds of jobs. So people like little DSL, Hadoop DSL snippets with some Groovy in between, and actually generate generate all these things at build time. You know, rather than writing out Hadoop DSL for hundreds of jobs, they write Groovy functions that generate it for them. So the second really key aspect of the Hadoop DSL is that it's a language, so you can have a static checker. First of all, unlike when you write Azkaban or Uzi XML files, uh, Groovy will check your syntax. Check your syntax at build time, right? Because, hey, it's just Groovy. So my boss wanted me to say that at some point. Um, it actually type checks your methods. Some things in Hadoop DSL take ints or floats and strings and so on like that, and they must type check. The Hadoop DSL makes a number of semantic checks. That's just checking rules. It checks that the job names you declare, that they have to actually be valid according to Azkaban or Uzi rules, you know, depending on what you build for. Checks that your workflows can't have job cycles. That's what that's you have. Job one depends on job two, and job two depends on job one. That would be a cycle. You can't have that. We check, uh, we check a lot of things. You know, we check like maybe 20 or 30 things. And these things, um, otherwise, what you would happen is developers, they would write down sort of manually their files, upload them to Azkaban. It says, no, this is invalid. They got to figure out why. They upload to Azkaban. They run half their workflow. It dies. Why did it die? Well, there was a problem with the job parameters. But when you use the Hadoop DSL, it just checks it for you at build time. That's it, and you're guaranteed, at least for the job checks that we have, that you won't you won't get those uh, you won't get those errors. Just a quick question on, on the syntax checking. The syntax checking helps when you're actually deploying your package. You've got your code and your scripts all put together and packaged with it nice. You've checked all the syntax, and you know that that's not going to be the source of a problem. But the code and the jar files could be still. Yes, your code, your jobs. You could have a problem yeah. with your jobs. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. And, and
Local testing, yeah. So we, we recommend our users use, say, MapReduce unit testing framework, and we have some support for that at, at LinkedIn. But it's, yeah. so, so you do have support for your local Hadoop? We have local, yes. There are a couple of frameworks that actually come with MapReduce, with Hadoop, yeah. for local unit testing, yeah. and they work. They're not the simplest things to work with, yeah. but they, they, they mostly work. That's a good idea. We don't have any explicit support for it, but um, you know, having a testing mode in the Hadoop DSL would be it makes a lot of sense. It sounds like there's an opportunity. You know, I I think there absolutely is. I think there absolutely is. Thank. Um, so let's see. So let me try to let's let's add my last slide in this section. So um, so at the end of the day, right? You compile Hadoop DSL. Like the slides that we, the Hadoop DSL stuff that we had before, and it spits out. If you say build for Uzi, it's our build for Azkaban. It spits out an Azkaban file, right? And so I, you don't have to, you know, read too much. I just wanted to kind of show. This is a file for that Azkaban will take, and I, I just wanted to show, you know, what it spits out at the the end of the day. Um, and also, this would be if you uploaded if you uploaded the sample code that I showed you. This would be the little dag, right? It just has job test two and job test two dependent on job test one that you had. So first, Azkaban would run job test one, and then it would run job workflow one test two, and then it would say, hey, workflow is complete. OK. So I, I do want to give people a chance to take a break. So I have some things that about implementing the DSL. And let me just say that uh, you can catch me during the, the break for details, which is kind of a shame because you know, I think it's interesting stuff. But basically, the DSL makes quite a bit of use of function pointers, closures, delegates, those kind of those kind of things. Yeah. So grab me during the break if you if you want to learn more. Um, I also rejected a number of common Groovy DSL mechanisms. Um, and I have those in the appendix, and I can also tell you, like Groovy Builders actually actually rejected it for the DSL for a few different different reasons. Gradle domain objects also have problems with some classes. Rejected those. Um, so let me just wrap up and say um, what happened with the Hadoop plugin. He like said, people love the Hadoop DSL was really the the thing that brought people into the fold. They start actually adding when they we have a big email discussion list at the company about Hadoop, and uh, that really became the place where people send Hadoop DSL and talk about it. They actually use my documentation instead of the open source documentation, uh, and they're doing amazing things with the the Hadoop DSL. So, um, upcoming, we are basically working on features for Uzi. Uzi is what we we're working on. They're not complete. So, but we're really working on the Uzi DSL compiler. Um, and I do want to say, I wish there were a couple things in Gradle. I'm glad about plugins.gradle.org. I recently found out about it. That was something that I think uh, the thing that was happening. And um, another thing is um, actually namespaces for tasks and extensions. So if you apply two Gradle plugins in your project, and they both have a task named the same thing, you're done, and there's nothing you can do about it. You're done. It just doesn't work. At least that I know, so, so apologies if that's not Another thing that Gradle desperately needs is that um, if the Gradle daemon is running, it is impossible to ask from the command line for a masked password. We have a very complicated workaround for this. So when, you, when you're supposed to upload to Azkaban, it asks for your password. And we don't want you that to appear on the screen. Sounds so simple, but it is so hard to do in, in Gradle. Uh, so finally, to wrap up, I just want to say that um, we do think the future of Gradle LinkedIn is that actually every service team will publish its own Gradle plugin and some kind of mini language for users to use those plugins. We think that that's the, the future of what will happen at the company, is that not just Hadoop, but search and, you know, Machine learning teams will all publish their plugins, and they'll have a little mini configuration language, maybe as elaborate as Hadoop DSL, maybe not. 
So I'm sorry that we don't have quite time to complete the rest of the, the things. I had to skip over a couple of things because I, I would have loved to tell you about them. But um, come grab me, and I will free you for the opportunity to use the restroom. So because of the time, I, let's not make you sit here to ask Q&A, but I will just stay here until they, they kick us out for the next talk. Uh, and uh, let's do it. Let's do it that way. So thank you guys for listening and enjoy. Please enjoy the conference very much.